think so far with my documentary, a lot of what I've gotten isn't necessarily about the impact, but more just about people's reactions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really cool side of Dixmont is, okay, well this is a hospital for people, but then also how it just affects people emotionally and mentally and everything like that. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that is portrayed in how fondly Dixmont is spoken of. Mm -hmm. You only, I mean, just in my experience, and again, I'm a 14 year old doing a research project, mm -hmm. um, you only ever hear positive things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really cool part of the hospital's history. Dixmont Hospital opened in 1862. And originally, West Penn Hospital mm -hmm. was the one that it moved from West Penn. When West Penn Hospital became overcrowded, it was clear that a mental institution needed to be built. Thus, the idea for Dixmont Hospital was conceived. And actually, I worked at West Penn Hospital then. But there wasn't said much about Dixmont because most people never heard of it. It just wasn't that important, I guess, to people, since none of them had families in it. The hospital was named after Dorothea Dix, an activist for mental health care. Dorothea Dix was a crusader in the best sense of the crusaders of the 19th century. She was the agitator to scold the legislatures of something like 13 different states to do more to provide for the care and treatment of those who had mental illness. The hospital was to be a refuge for those with diseases of the mind. Up until that time, the mentally ill were basically ignored in society, or if they were dangerous, they were locked up, uh, or even tied down like a dog would be in a, in a backyard, that sort of thing. Miss Dix was given the honor of choosing the site. This land, which features an awe-striking view, was chosen because of its bountiful access to natural resources, as well as its location next to the river and a railroad. Eventually, the hospital would expand to utilize nearly all of its property. Dixmont consisted of 407 acres and about 60 buildings, so we had a lot of places to explore and stuff. Many patients were admitted to the hospital by family members who either couldn't care for them or didn't want to. Someone, maybe even an epileptic or someone today that you don't think is necessarily different, they just put them in Dixmont. I think their lives would have been different if their families maybe had kept them or put them in individual places because this became their only home. That's all they had. Very few of them had visitors. The staff provided what they believed was the best care possible for the patients. This included some controversial treatments such as electroshock and lobotomy, which often left the patients scarred and amnesic. There wasn't much to do for them because they didn't have any major drugs. They just had no real help. I guess they had shock therapy and they used to put them in tubs of water and all kinds of things, but which they do none of that now. I really don't know how they treated. You know, it seemed like everybody was well treated and working toward getting these people well. Dixmont maintained a very family-oriented mindset. This meant little reprehension and freedom to roam the grounds. I think the most important part was probably just that they were able to walk around, walk outside. They were always well staffed, and a lot of the staff had probably been there a long time. But I can't say enough about how good they were with them. Dixmont also used a method called occupational therapy. This meant that patients would complete therapeutic chores and tasks around the hospital grounds. These could be anything from working in the garden to tidying up the parlor. Inside the hospital, there in the, on the, in the basement floor, there were numerous tunnels with railroad tracks in them. The tunnels were used to, to convey laundry, uh, other items that the hospital need, needed from building to building. On these tracks, they had push carts, and the patients would push the carts along the tracks. Well, as I understand it, the Self-sufficiency was part of the therapy of the patients that kept them busy and interested in things that were going on around the hospital. And of course, that also served to grow the food that they used, uh, a lot of the food that they used to uh, feed the patients. Uh, so they had animals that were kept and fields that were growing vegetables and so on and so forth. And so it was all part of the the uh, treatment. 
We went to the barn to see the cows and the chickens and horses. And, and it was really neat because the patients would work on And then there was a field that they planted, very agriculture. Other forms of therapy included baking, painting, and other crafts, like this rice portrait done by a patient. I just ordered what I needed for the cookie baking, and it was funny, even though they were old and had never done any cooking, after a few weeks they knew how to do it. I mean, they learned how to roll the dough out or drop the cookies or however I made them, they really got into it. Many of the patients were able to enjoy outings and activities in the community, such as picnics and fundraising events. I had that big bus that took them to ball games, and it took the men out occasionally just for breakfast or a beer. When we had the picnic, the, the aides had them all dressed beautifully in shorts and short sleeve shirts, and they had a really good time because we got in for them a watermelon and we got beer in for them. They are used to having porches or bathrooms like ours, because that's what they really liked. There were also a variety of activities available on the property. A tennis court, softball field, and ice rink were enjoyed by staff and patients alike. And I used to play softball, the patients did. And uh, it was sort of funny because the patients would play softball, but they weren't like a normal team. They were people that didn't really understand the game. Although treatments and faculty were thriving, the hospital could not keep up with the number of patients being admitted daily. The facility became overcrowded, and the hospital found it could not keep up with the financial demands. They applied to the state for financial aid and converted from a private hospital, thus changing their name to Dixmont State Hospital. The state, newly in control of the Dixmont facility, was trying to phase out inpatient care. They wouldn't give the hospital permission to perform even the simplest of treatments. With the dwindling budget and no support from the state, Dixmont finally lost its stubborn battle and was forced to close in 1984. The main buildings were torn down in 2006. Several years later, the property became available. I believe it was 1998, and we were one of seven bidders on the property, and we were the successful bidders. We closed on the property and purchased it in February of 1999 and immediately uh, began subdividing certain sections of it and we started renovating the uh, Camerata building which we named the Hemsworth Commons building. We have approximately 15 tenants in there and uh, we've developed the top of the hill that's a, a paintball uh, court where they have competitive paintball shooting, they go up there and shoot each other. It's there on five acres up there. Made an agreement with Walmart through ASC development and we sold 75 acres of it for a new super Walmart. They had a landslide problem about five or six years ago which ended the possibility of building a Walmart there. They are currently still there moving dirt trying to correct the landslide problem. When we met with Walmart uh, Two years ago, they had already spent $50 million. The Jackson, when they were building the Walmart, this whole, that whole hill collapsed and covered up for 65. Daily, hundreds of people unknowingly drive by the hill that once housed a sanctuary, a home for the unwanted and broken. They had all been there pretty much a long time, and then after it closed, they pretty much just went out on their own, and you really didn't know where they landed. I mean, they could have gone back, they could have gone on the street even, because we never heard what happened to them. Which leaves us to think, someday will the hospital and all of the lives it touched be forgotten completely? These people have nowhere to go. They're pretty much homeless. And those are the people we read about that live under bridges and have schizophrenia or something that everyone just sort of stays away from them. And they go from place to place, I think. You know, I never found out what happened to any of them, really, not any of them. It, it did a good thing, and it was too bad it had to close. 
because I don't think there's anything that replaced it. Mm -mm. So I don't know what your generation will do from it because I don't think they're going to build them again. Will we be able to remember or will it fade back into non-existence?